Hi, my name is Kevin Oliveira. I'm Senior Product Marketing Manager here at Forcepoint for Data Security Solutions. Today I have joining me Toby Dixon. He's a Senior Technical Marketing Engineer at Forcepoint. And what we will be doing is we will be doing a demo on Forcepoint One Data Security. It's a new product we recently launched that is our cloud DLP offering. And so it's a DLP SaaS offering for um, uh, endpoint, as well as uh, it's able to cover a number of different channels, which I'll be speaking to in a few minutes. Um, one of the things we want to highlight is that we're very aware of the AI transformation that is going on with organizations today. And it really is changing everything, even more than what we had seen with digital transformation. Uh, Gen AI is, is being leveraged, just a tremendous resource for productivity, but you do need to keep your data safe when you use generative AI. Um, it's very um, easy to put sensitive information into Gen AI um, chats. And so we wanna be able to help our customers to be able to protect their data as they're going through this AI transformation. Some of the key questions they ask is who's using sensitive data? What kinds of data is being used? Where is it going? How is it being used? And so there's this need for visibility in terms of Gen AI. And then how do you seamlessly enforce data security everywhere. And so how do you keep, how are you able to enforce policies, enforce control over that data across um, those Gen AI applications, within cloud applications, within the web, on your endpoints and email, all across the board. So we, we're looking to do that for our customers. That's a major consideration, particularly with Force One Data Security. Force by One Data Security has uh, a number of different things um, related to cloud DLP, that makes it a, a really a strong product for um, uh, many of our customers. One of it is fully, it's fully cloud-based. So it has, it does um, uh, updates over the air as we get new policies, new templates, you're able to get those as they continually happen as well as updates just in general to the product. Um, it has uh, multi-channel policies and dashboards, which you'll be seeing in a moment. It's very easy to use. The U UI was designed to be very intuitive. And we've gotten a lot of compliments from our customers about how easy this UI is. Um, also, it's uh, got 1,700 plus built-in policies, templates, and classifiers. It's the highest number of any major DLP solution in the market. And that helps you identify data, which gives you very strong visibility into what the data is that you have. And then you can build policies against it to, to be able to control it and prevent data exfiltration. Our Force One data security is very, very fast. and one of the things that we've seen with uh, some of our competitive uh, or some competitor DLP SaaS solutions is it often takes a long time for policies to deploy or the incidents to actually appear for a, a data security admin to be able to manage, sometimes up to 24 hours. Hours happens within uh, just a few seconds. Sometimes it's near real time. The policies deploy immediately. Incidents um, are um, visible almost immediately. And this, is, we feel, is essential for managing DLP. And so um, uh, it's a surprise when we see the length of time it takes for other cloud solutions for DLP. It also does deploy very quickly across um, literally hundreds of thousands of endpoints. It's able to deploy um, and, and uh, be out and, and ready to use very quickly. It makes use of our proven DLP engine. Uh, we've, we've been selling DLP on-prem for many, many years. And um, in addition to that 1,700 plus built-in templates and policies classifiers, we also are able to cover 900 plus uh, real file types. So the file types also is, a, it's also a, um, a big thing for us because many of our competitors tend to stick with files that are, or file types that are within their ecosystem. Whereas we're willing, we're able to go be well beyond our ecosystem, and then give very high accuracy in terms of um, uh, detecting file types. We have risk adaptive um, automation, which you'll be uh, seeing more in the demo, uh, which uh, helps us to be able to see the context of data, how data is moving, and what kind of risk is being introduced by data movement. And then last, what I mentioned here, more than just DLP, it has data security everywhere, and so we do have very strong endpoint DLP that's that's fully cloud enabled. It's a DLP SaaS endpoint. It includes device control, and you'll see that. 
we're able to um, cover other channels as well. And so we, we, we're aware that often many customers will have a separate DLP for their CASB, a separate one for their SWIG, maybe another separate one for their email. They have another one for their endpoint, maybe two on their endpoint. We're able to bring all of those together into a single DLP instance. And so you're able to see from the endpoint or from the cloud apps or from the web um, uh, or email, you're able to see all of the different places where incidents could be happening, where data could be potentially exfiltrated, and we're able to cr create policies one place that, that goes across all of those different channels. And you'll see more of that in the demo as well. So now let's go ahead and move over to the demo. We have Toby and he'll be sharing um, how Forceful One Data Security works. Thank you, Kevin. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So what we're looking at here from, from the dashboard's perspective, uh, we are in the dashboard where you can start to get a look at all of the top risk users and kind of get an overall view of the entire organization as far as the risk and data risk and uh, risk in general as far as actions. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And as you can see here on the right, you'll see a list of users kind of varying in uh, risk score. I'll show you what makes up these risk scores in a moment. So. What we're going to take a look at are not only the ability to look at the risk scores over a period of 30 days, but also seven days and uh, in the last 24 hours to kind of pinpoint certain users or certain alerts if we're looking at the types of alerts from those users and, and who's got kind of the top alert, uh, top alerts of the spectrum and possibly even who's got the most critical by removing any of the lower alerts. Uh, so that way we can this kind looks of great get an idea. as far as a, yeah, I'm just saying yeah, from the, a prioritization. Prioritization standpoint, you're able to quickly see who are some of your most risky users, the ones that have the highest alerts, be able to um, know your direction in terms of what you want to do for, to triage the situation. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of triage, a couple of the other things that you can do here is when you're looking at kind of that detective behavior, we mesh that uh, contextual and that content detected behavior uh, that, we, that we're that we looking at, looking for, we mesh it together so we can kind of get an idea as an administrator what to focus on, whether you're gonna be focused on something that's larger, that's gonna be more, uh, you know, uh, contextual basis of what they're doing on the machine and at the time, or if it's gonna be something that's more uh, uh, database, you know, are they using certain data in a way that's not congruent with company policy? And you can kind of focus on that, but you can also get an idea of what they're doing together and looking at kind of the top match rules in adjacent to the top alerts or the riskiest users. So one other thing I find that's very, very helpful as an administrator is that you can look at data movement. Where is it going? Like, is it all, is it a system event where it's more of a contextual event or is it more of somebody's printing out data or uh, sending data that's uh, all over the web that they should be sending or other, other channels such as, uh, you know, other channels uh, such as, Web channels, administrative, removable media. That's a channel that a lot of people will use in order to try and uh, move data, whether it's legitimately moving that data uh, into removable media or whether it's something that might be you know, trying to get some data moved off the system, whether it's intentional or whether it's accidental, we still are monitoring that. Are you going to say something, Kevin? Oh, no, I um, I just, I've, I, I see it also in here as well, but the um, what you did have in the dashboard that we were just looking at under the system alerts, you had uh, our top match rules. You had DLP, but you also have Neo listed there. So it has uh, two different types that I'm seeing there. Just was wondering how are those, what's the distinction between those rules? So what you're gonna see is in um, in the Neo side, you're gonna see things more like user change policy, or you're gonna see uh, some one of the 131 IOBs, that's indicators of uh, behavior that, that we're monitoring for on the endpoint. That kind of gives us the context of what that user is doing on the endpoint that might be separate from the data. And now we're also yeah, joining that with what they're doing with the data. So for instance, someone might be uh, saving data to a USB file, but they're also clearing out the audit log that shows they connected the USB. That will be considered maybe a whole picture of that, of that user being risky because that tends to uh, go along with malicious behavior. Or it could be a system administrator actually doing the, uh, something specifically administrative like, and they're moving data off to back data on back up data on a system, and they're also then clearing logs or they're then you know, changing policy, et cetera. So it, it really does matter on what that user's role is and what the context of what they're doing uh, based on how, and, and also in conjunction of how they're using that data. So that's what you're going to see as far as.
Neo and then DLP. And then when we get into the users, this is how, kind of how we marry that. I'm going to jump into the users, and you can see there's a lot of risk here. But we're going to come back to that in a second. We're going to jump over here to alerts, and we can see um, where where we may have multiple users that are you know logging system events or having web events, but you see they're using maybe encrypted files or uh, you know specific P, uh, violating specific PII application uh, PII policies uh, for DLP. But for a particular user, we can kind of zoom in on any particular user. In fact, let me go back to users here for uh, for the risk. And I can zoom into a particular user like this Lisa demo. Now this Lisa demo has got a, a risk score of 64. And you can see they only have a handful of alerts versus someone who has a much lower risk, uh, risk score, uh, such as, uh, you know, Bobby or even uh, Tommy, who has a much, a much higher level of alerts, but a lower risk score. So that goes to show that we're not just looking at the number of alerts that are happening and just counting them up. Uh, we're looking at the context of what they're doing and what they're doing on the um, machine versus, and in addition to the type of data that they're touching. That's tremendous as far as being able to see, you see the risk that's um, present in the environment um, that, inter that individuals are bringing to the environment, but you're also seeing alerts. And uh, naturally you think 775, that's a risky person. But it's um, it's in the in the context, it's it's not showing that, and so it's uh, you you would probably take a different approach. For instance, yes. Uh, so for instance, Tommy may uh, actually be IT and has 775 files or files that he's charged with moving over for backup. So that's that's part of the job, part of the uh, the devices that he that 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 he's logged into, et cetera. But mm -hmm. whereas uh, Lisa is um, is 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 HR, uh, the context of what she's doing may be a little bit different. She might be using, in this case, as we look at her timeline. So what's wonderful about this is we can start to get a timeline here to kind of get an idea of where that, uh, that risk score comes from and how long that she's been, uh, you know, what she's been doing over a longer period of time, getting a little bit more detailed into the data that she's touching, um, as well as the devices that she's, she's connecting to. And if there's a suspicious number of large files copied, so like removable storage. So for instance, here, we're looking at at some point, there was, uh, there was data that was collected, you know, registry files that were, that were saved for removable storage, as well as uh, PII data that might've been saved to, uh, to removable storage, in addition to a large mm -hmm. amount of data that's been connected to removable storage, and then repeatedly having actions that, uh, that might be considered risky for someone who might be in HR, uh, who may not need removable storage, may not need to have access to registry files or something like that. So it could be indicative of, of you know, something, someone else using her, her identity, or it could be indicative of uh, uh, something like uh, she's, you know, collecting data or possibly doing something that she's uh, doing a different job that she's, that she's not necessarily uh, qualified to do. So that risk being yes. elevated gives the a reason to, to investigate further. Go ahead. Well, as you're saying that with the risk and, and how you show that in the previous, um, screen with the investigation where there's the one the person that had 700 more uh incidents it's just that um is it is it an anomalous behavior and it right. seems like with this risk adaptive protection um, um united with our dlp and be able to see the risk you can see what is anomalous what is not anomalous and and anomalous is often it seems like that's a a uh an indicator of a risky situation and it's uh, someone doing something that's just not typical of their work. Whereas for Tommy, 775 might be what you see every day. It's just, that's just where he is. And it's like, right. um, whereas that the 107 one is like, th that might be a lot of stuff going on that shouldn't be happening. It's just, it's anomalous. Right. Yep. Right. So, yes. <clears throat> so also there's a couple of other uh, things I'd like to point out. We're looking at the alerts, like for instance, uh, for Lisa, or for even Jackie over here, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, multiple, yeah, multiple, you know, triggers, multiple uh, policies that are violated. When we're looking at these uh, policies that are violated, we're looking at this entire uh, timeline and trying to get an idea of what the alerts are. Uh, we're going to jump into that, show that user details. We can actually see where that user, you know, who that user is logged in as. We can shoot, see where they're, uh, where where they are logged into, and we can continually get, actually jump over here to alerts themselves, just for that user, actually. Let me actually jump back and jump in here, there we go. 
and then we can actually go to user insights here and we can see everything that that user is doing that risk that risk summary uh, over a period of, over a timeline for that user and those alerts for that user and we can also get an idea of which channels that user is using uh, and where their destinations were when they were when they were uh, when their risk score was elevated and we can correlate that with specific alerts as well as the exact behavior. Did you see anything when you're looking at the the behavior? Is there anything that's standing out that's like this is this is very unusual for this type of person? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. There's things that stand out from that from for for this particular person. And I'm seeing how much data is actually being saved. I know that they're not uh, normally a USB uh, user, and I also know that I see that they're using app, different applications. I can take a look at the applications, the specific removal media alerts. This all kind of raises an eyebrow, if you will, as I look through that uh, those top match rules, similar to what you saw in the initial dashboard. I can start to see, okay, they're you know, they're they're looking at social security numbers. They've been looking at social security numbers. Um, you know, they, they've been um, looking at driver's license numbers, so that is part of their job. But now we're starting to see registry files, you know, and then we're starting to see, uh, you know, devices that shouldn't be attached to that, that machine, start to be attached to that machine. So it starts to form a picture of something that we need to have a discussion with that person on or uh, block their access from, from, from specific data. Uh, so maybe because they are an HR person, maybe we just make them a view only, okay? Or we can also increase their risk level. As a, as a thought to say that, hey, we're going to call them a risky person for now, because at that level of risk, um, now that they're 70, they're going to they reach a different tier of um, policy enforcement. So no matter what data that they're touching, they can no longer copy it anywhere. They can view it. But they can't do anything with it to a removable device up to a cloud storage, whether it's going to be corporate or uh, personal. They can't move it. To, they may not be able to move it onto the network. They may not be able to copy paste it either. Okay. Uh, so by by adjusting their score, now that we see that that person's at a higher risk, we see a, a timeline. We're kind of curious about it. We're on the fence. We can adjust that score to a high score, which affects all of the different policies and which risk adaptive protection is part of for that user. Does that make sense? It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, it'll be interesting when we get to policies I'd, I'd, and how policies are set up. How how that impacts the policy then, as you, you'd mentioned yep. the policy enforcement. Let's let's actually jump into that. You're you're absolutely right. Let's jump into that. So right now we're into policies, and uh, just kind of give you an idea. We are we have a lot of predefined policies. Over um, you have hundreds of predefined policies, and we cover all 150 uh, regions, 89 countries. Cover PII and PHI from uh, Japanese national numbers to New Jersey driver's licenses. Um, so we, we cover a lot of, of data to protect, we identify a lot of data to protect data in addition to working with any data classification solution and, uh, and be able to read any tags. So let me show you how we're actually going to, we're going to actually jump into one of the, uh, one of the, oops, that's not the right one. All right. The I, I. No. So we're going to jump into a policy set. And so I jump into the policy mm -hmm. set, like drop, drop down to the bottom and actually edit one of the policies here so we can walk through what that looks like. Okay. Um, yeah. So with that policy, obviously policy name, et cetera, we're going to take a look at those conditions. So the condition that's been violated, for instance, in this case, is, is the U.S. name and uh, Social Security number. So they both have to be together uh, within, near in the record in order to be considered a record that, that the policy is going to trigger on. But we can add right. multiple and when we, we look at these, we can add any of those 1,700 classifiers that, that, that we're looking at. We can, also add, we can also add our own. We can also add our own file labeling. So as I mentioned earlier, we work with any particular file labeling, whether it's Titus or uh, whether it's Microsoft, and we can choose to, um, uh, to look at whatever tag that, that that document may have in order to continue to enforce that data security for IP, uh, healthcare data, PHI, PII, et cetera. Okay, we can combine classifiers. There's a lot that we can do here. Okay. So the next question is, where is it coming from? Okay, do we want to be specific about where we're, where, who, we're, who we're looking at, whether it's going to be individual users or whether it's going to be uh, specific groups? So for instance, HR, if, we're, if, we, if we have particular policies that are governing HR, since they do touch sensitive data, maybe we're looking at creating a policy for HR that uh, triggers on a lower risk setting. Okay. 
because you're already dealing with mm -hmm. sensitive data. So that's a possibility. Okay. And then where's that destination? Where's it going? You know, we're very concerned about where people are sending that data. Um, so are they printing it you know, on the local side? We have the ability of printing rural media applications land. You know, what does that mean? Uh, that means that we can monitor all of that. We can also monitor all the different types of application groups, such as, uh, you know, if somebody downloads a AOL Messenger, Trillion, you know, if somebody's looking at uh, zipping it with 7-zip instead of Windows uh, compression, uh, if someone's looking to uh, use different browsers. We have all these application groups that we're looking at that we're including into this, um, in addition to any particular online application groups that we're looking at. And furthermore, we... Go ahead. I mean, yeah, as you're looking at this, because I, I know first you select the destination endpoint, and then you have these other yep. ones underneath it. So these are these are endpoint related destinations yes, or types, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Great. Absolutely. So, so these, these are all, all these are all enforceable. We also cover it, have visibility into it. We can cover it all. We can enforce it right there at the endpoint. That's you're absolutely right, Kevin. Um, and do, right. including LAN. So in many cases, there are uh, some users that you know have access to maybe one share, but shouldn't be saving anything to the share or copying anything from the share up to I don't know, like a cloud um, instance, you know, cloud storage. Mm -hmm. So that would be an example of why you want to monitor the LAN. Um, we also are monitoring right. email, endpoint email, so like your Outlook or uh, and then of course cloud email. We're also monitoring web. So what I find very helpful about monitoring the web is that uh, in conjunction with our uh, you know, uh, Swig solutions, we're able to see all the different URL categories, uh, whether they be custom URL categories or whether they're um, you know, the default URL categories, and we can kind of cover them as well. So when somebody is, like human resources, is maybe using generative AI as an example and saying that they're going to, uh, um, you know, that they're looking at doing, that part, doing this part for their job, we can start to say, hey, right. maybe if you're if you're HR, we don't want you using generative AI. Okay, we could say if you're using generative AI specifically, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and block that in general. You know, or we're gonna give you a higher risk score. Any number of things that we could say for that because we don't want HR as a group specifically in this example yep. necessarily using generative AI. Now, one one thing you had mentioned just now as far as Swig. So, um, what this is, what's going on? There's this one policy, but you're controlling DLP uh, actions. Um, and yep. from the endpoint in the email here, we were just talking about Swig, and then I see CASB there is listed as well. So it's all happening oh, yeah. right here, but it's it's a single interface for all of it. You're absolutely right, Kevin. Absolutely. So we're at, we're looking yeah. at we're we're tied directly into or you know CASB we're tied directly into a Swig, uh, email email security uh, as well, and then we're able to see everything on the endpoint, and we can say, hey, we want to be able to. Uh, um, manage all of the data protection mm -hmm. for all of the channels in one policy. Right. How, how many of these applications then are we able to control from here? Um, in the oh, CASB? well, so we're looking at anything that's, that's being controlled by the CASB. Our CASB has a library of over 800,000 applications, uh, plus pretty much any any custom app. So if you have a, uh, uh, excuse me, any, um, um, you know, uh, yeah, custom app that you have, uh, SAS app, um, you know, bring your own app and uh, it, it's, you know, protect it with Forcepoint CASB. Can be added and, as well. And we can, wow. And, and yeah, exactly. And we can, and we can protect the data that's uh, being downloaded or uploaded to it, um, both up and down, up and down uh, in the stream. That's great. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, and also that, that's also data in motion. We also are looking at data at rest as well. So if we're looking at data at rest, we can go ahead and say, hey, I'm, I want to look at any file downloading or what public sharing or external file sharing uh, as an API connection. And, um, and we this can is get also in the CASB as well. as well? This is also part Maybe of the CASB Cas capabilities as well. Wow. Okay. Yep. So, um, so I'm going to disable that for now because I'm not going to mess with my uh, policy a little bit later on here. So. What we're also looking at here is also the the, the threshold. So obviously, you know, mm -hmm. right now I've got numeric thresholds one, you know, one, five, and ten. And for uh, social security number, email, social security number, end name, one, five, and ten. Hey, you know, that's that's not um, terribly outside the realm of possibility. But I also have risk adaptive uh, enabled. So before I get to risk adaptive enabled, sure. let me jump back over here to to the the the, the action plan here. So with our action mm -hmm. plans, we have audit only. So force point. Data security allows the administrators to take higher organization from an audit only, watching only, 
all the way through confirming or either encryption, even quarantining, all the way to block all. And you can do it That's by great. simple thresholds, or you could do it in risk adaptive protection, and you're doing it for all of the channels. You you'd mentioned earlier with risk adaptive protection. So like if, if someone was a high or someone was you know, uh, the, the person you were looking at, Lisa, she was medium, she was marked as a high, it was gonna change right. the type of uh, action that was gonna happen. Absolutely, absolutely. So right. what you're looking at here, the way we're doing it here by accumulating or looking at these individual uh, in, individual um, action plan, with the action plan individually, excuse me, with this condition, uh, we can go mm -hmm. ahead and say, hey, you know, every time that they hit five, it's just gonna give them a confirmation. Every time they hit, you know, they're gonna try to copy five. So they might try to copy four. Uh, every time they try and copy 10, they get blocked. So they might just try and copy nine every single time. Okay, nothing happens. It's just you can hit the same action plan every single time. But with risk adaptive protection, every time they do that, their risk level can increase. It affects their risk level. And then once they get to a certain risk level, depending on the data that they have touched, whether it's from this policy or multiple others, as the risk level goes up, we can, t we can say that we want them to confirm. And then ultimately, as the risk level gets medium or high, we can say that we just want to block all or critical. So, for instance, right. even if they if they've been touching, if they've been uh, the HR lady, I think we're using Lisa as an example. If she was, you know, copying reg edit, edit files and then also uh, maybe, um, you know, kind of open, signing in and 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 I don't know, um, using personal, you know, personal OneDrive or personal uh, Google Drive. Okay, and then she was mm -hmm. doing that, and all of a sudden her risk score based on that context had raised, uh, then had elevated, then with that elevated risk score, even though she was only copying one or two or five, just under the threshold of, of, of sensitive data, because her risk level is high, she's gonna get blocked from being able to she's do that. She's gonna be blocked, right. This seems great as far as, uh, it's a way to automate um, actions and enforcement. So it's like, instead yeah. of having to um, go through a lot of different incidents, and then the other, um, part is it's um it's not only it's been um automated for them but then uh it should be able to and i've i've heard of this from other customers that they've been able to reduce their false positives by quite a bit yes because they just you're not blocking you know and and that is often i i'll hear that customers are concerned about blocking they don't want to block too much um because they're they're concerned that it'll slow the business down and we're concerned about that as well and it's just this ability then to be able to to take data context or the the context of what's going on with data and then um, apply that directly into the policy can really be a big help in terms of reducing false positives and um, just making the whole DLP experience much more efficient. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and furthermore, we don't necessarily, we're not in the business of stopping business. We're in the business of enabling people to continue work while protecting right. that uh, that data. And that's yeah, exactly yeah. What, what the action plans for coaching or dropping emails or encryption is. It allows, you know, in, in quarantining, it allows the business to continue, but still with safeguards, with guardrails around it that can be trusted. Right, that's great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and save this, uh, this policy. Um, and when I save that policy, save that policy, it tells me that I have some pending changes. So this is going to be important a little bit later. I'm at DLP version 25, and I'm going to go ahead and like you know push these changes, deploy these changes, uh, which is just very fast. You don't have to wait hours for you to deploy changes or have a whole bunch of changes to deploy. You can do it pretty quickly. Um, and while I'm doing that, there's a couple other things I want to show you. Uh, we're going to jump over to uh, user activity monitoring. Is your activity monitoring, this is what we're talking about, you know, risk adaptive protection, okay? We're looking at mm -hmm. over 130 IOBs, indicators of behavior, and we're kind of looking at, you know, anything at all. So you saw earlier we were looking at the, the registry files. Um, so if I'm looking at, so in one of the alerts from Linda is that she had, she had been messing with registry files. So here's one of the IOBs. So you're saving the registry file to removable storage, so 208. That's what that's what she had she was doing. But you can see here for registry files in general, uh, depending on how the organization sees them, we have them set up and a different you know a couple of different ways here. Where if somebody's accessing registry a registry file and copying it to a network share, that may not be considered a high risk action. Okay, and that's right. a, that's a low right. severity. And then and you get a little bit higher when you're copying it to removable storage, and then high when you're uh, copying it to uh, the whole registry. Is, is, you know, files from the registry is copied, copied or moved uh, to removable storage, and then very critical when you're moving it to a personal cloud. Because in most cases, there's no reason for that. 
um, and you right. can see which channels that we're actually looking at here. And we can come in here and we can adjust. You know, we can take a look at these IOBs directly and we can adjust how we see that, uh, how it's actually um, measured. And this adjusts the risk score as well. So if someone doing one mm -hmm. of these actions that's permitted as an IT person, it's more informative. It's a low risk, okay? So the IT people, you know, that, that's fine. But someone who's uh, HR, this is not something that's great. So we can we can actually specify, hey, you know, uh, these particular groups in HR. If anybody's doing that, that is definitely a critical uh, a critical event that will raise their risk score uh, to a point where they should not be able to handle that sensitive data. Still, be maybe be able to look at it, but not be able to exfiltrate it. That, that seems sense? important as far as with it, yeah, within risk data protection, you're able to. I mean, it's, it's not so rigid. You can make some adjustments based on yes. what your business sees and how the ser severity of a particular rule, or even based on roles, you're able to um, yes. change it based on roles. So as someone in finance, they should be dealing with credit cards. So it's like that, that would make sense. Um, someone in marketing, not necessarily, unless they were maybe doing POs, otherwise there's just really no reason. And so it's, uh, you're right. able to make those changes um, based on your business. Right, exactly. And um, yeah. let me jump ro over to why we have uh, some device control here. So obviously we're working with the endpoint here and, and, and we're monitoring several things. We're monitoring the device itself. So what I get from medical uh, you know, organizations, a lot of times they'll say, you know, do you have anything that we can use for kiosk or, or even um, you know, students and uh, maybe medical hospitals or medical uh, uh, colleges? But I said, you have anything we can do with kiosks? You know, we have some people that use multiple, one, multiple people using the same machine, and we don't want them plugging in USBs all the time and, and copying data to it. So I would say, hey, this is where you can actually specify a local user or a student USB policy, where you can uh, specify, hey, you know, we're going to block that that USB anytime that somebody uh, connects to removable storage that's on these kiosk endpoints. So we can have a, a group of endpoints, you know, specific endpoints that we can uh, that we can uh, apply this to, um, and then we can even get you know, even granular with the with the notification and specify the notification, letting people know, hey, this is a this is unauthorized device on this kiosk. You cannot use this device on this kiosk, so they know, and make it a manual close as well, so it's something they have to click on to to move past. Uh, but maybe even if it's something that uh, corporate users can use, such as you have cor you maybe have contractors and corporate users, you can specify that uh, you know you're going to have it as a read only. You you can you can use the you can use it. But if you are a local user, not a domain user, if you're logging as a local machine user, uh, you can only, it's read only. So you might find this in right. like a, a Kinkos or something like that. It's a read only. You can't put anything yeah. to it. You can read off of it. Um, so yeah. we find that those Maybe use cases with happen with students. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm saying with device control uh, being included with our enforcement one data security, I think you know general DLP endpoint often has they'll have stuff about USB drives. They'll have some things. This one, you get a, a much more extensive uh, visibility into what's going on on that um, removable drive. And you're able to, um, you see that, see data going out, see data coming in, you can also then control it. You've got the uh, ability to do actions on it. And so there's um, just a lot more uh, visibility and control around that, um, these removable devices. Oh yes, and uh, in addition to that, uh, Kevin, there's also risk adaptive protection applied to that as well. So we can apply mm -hmm. risk adaptive protection uh, so that that risk also goes up. So the more times you try it, or for instance, if you uh, uh, your risk is already high and you have a USB attached, guess what? You no longer can use that USB. So you were able to use that USB an hour ago. Now your risk level has increased because of certain contextual or content related actions. And now you can no longer mm -hmm. use that, yet, that USB based on that risk adaptive protection. Right, right. So, so I think that's great. So let's go back to, we're going to take a quick look at, um, uh, I think it was Bobby we're, we're going to be looking at today. Um, and uh, Bobby's, you know, been doing pretty good. He's got a lot of work done. You know, he's got a very low risk score here. And then keep in mind, we also had a, a DLP version of 25. So if you come over here, um, that, let's make sure we're actually logged in as Bobby here. Logged in. Bobby, Bobby B. So Bobby Demo, one of the big, uh, users of the demo family. Um, he's got a lot of cool data, you know, he's got uh, some some data such as the these four records here. Okay. Uh, and he can, you know, he can go about his day, he can move the records around, but maybe he goes to go ahead and print that data 
and uh, and he accidentally prints it to his uh, D drive. Okay. And um, he go ahead. He, he prints that to his D drive. Oh, oh it's, where did it go? I uh, went to my D drive. Not a big deal. Okay. You know, he may be going about his day trying to trying to um, just get certain things done, and he ends up in his um, in his OneDrive, or excuse me, his uh, his email. Okay. And he's trying to compose mm -hmm. an email and saying, "Hey, you know, I'm gonna, um, you know, I'm I'm off today, and uh, I meant to send this data." Do work from home, and at this point he's saying, "Yeah, exactly." He's never seen this before from from a legal team or anybody. Um, <laughs> so sometimes it's like, "Oh Even yeah." Even he has uh, a laptop, gonna... he has a laptop, but he's uh, doing this through his email. Yeah, he's doing this through his email. Okay, and he's like, "Okay, I'm yeah. gonna go ahead and send that data." You know, that that's 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 cool. You know, yeah, no big deal. And it's like, oh wait, 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 wait. Maybe I need to, uh, you know, maybe there's more. You know, m maybe I need to worry about. I'm going to be off for maybe a couple of couple of days here. Maybe it's a long weekend. I totally forgot about that. Maybe I need to use my uh, my OneDrive. You know, maybe I need to throw uh, a couple things in there that maybe I need to work with. Okay, and it could be, you know, it could be, you know, it could be anything. Um, and he's thrown it into his. Uh, I don't know. It's called the Force Point Demo Drive. Um, <laughs> and if only this machine would work a little faster, it would give me a little bit more to work with here. So yeah, so now what we're doing is we're adding this into the here. So we're going to say, hey, I want to add, uh, um, we'll do a full file upload of a couple of things I need to work on, you know, while I'm out here. So I've got, uh, I don't know, what do I have here? Uh, got some more data that I can work on up here, and. I'm going to go ahead and load that up, okay? Now, keep in mind, he's at a risk score of zero, all right? So he's not risky. He's an HR person. He can be using data. Um, you know, maybe he's sanctioned to do this, okay? But then when we start looking at uh, maybe he's going to make a mistake and say, hey, I need to I need to upload a few extra things, okay? And, and maybe we don't know what he's up to, and he decides that he's going to upload, you know, a handful of things. Including his resume. <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna replace existing items. And uh, and he's uploaded a lot of the stuff. So you know, we we're, we're looking at a lot, a lot of a lot of data that's that's coming through. It's like, okay, well, you know, what is he doing? You know, we might. Uh, well, we'll jump right. back over to investigations in a minute, and then um, you know, and, and you know, maybe because. He wants to not be audited about this. He might come in here and say, "I want to. Uh, I don't want to be. I don't want to be audited for policy changes. I don't, I don't want. I don't. I want to. I want to turn that off for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, assuming that he's. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is this is something. These are all different so he's things. That cleaning can, his tracks. Kind yeah. of cleaning. Kind of cleaning his tracks. Exactly. And then yeah. <laughs> now he's going to say, "Hey, I'm going to go ahead and clear this log because I don't. I want to." I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to get out of here. You know, maybe I'm going to hang out with my buddy. Ah, huh, okay. Notice this. Read only access now on the on the uh, on the removable drive. Yeah, so he has it's really good too about that. To save the pop up comes up. Yeah, the pop up yep. comes up. It's just it's showing him he's being watched. It's it's yep. uh, been noticed. That often is very powerful as far as um, slowing down well, data filtration that. if that's going on. Oh, not only that. He had full access to his USB drive two minutes ago. Now, because his yeah. risk has elevated, he now has his mm -hmm. access has been reduced to read-only access. Right. So now, right. when he, when we go to when we go to save anything to, uh, for instance, when we go to print something to his USB drive now, when it printed to the tra to the flash drive, S23, he's going to get an error because he can't save anything to that uh, drive anymore. It's a full block. Yep, he's, he's blocked he's, from using yeah. that drive because his, his his risk has elevated. Right, right. So so it's adapted on the fly based on different actions that he has made, both on the system context as well as with the data. And so as now, can we, you as see we that in the interface? 
can you go can into definitely the interface? See the interface. See that in fact, now? let's jump over to the interface. So I'm going to do. Now keep in mind. Uh, actually, one thing I want to show you zero. real quick. Okay. This is zero. One thing I want to show you real quick while we're here, and I forgot to, forgot to do it earlier. So I talked to you about the DLP policy being 25, and we pushed out the DLP policy mm -hmm. what about five or six minutes ago. And so, and, and that was DOP policy 25 going to 26, and now we're at 26. The whole point of that is that we are not uh, waiting an hour or two hours or 24 hours for a DLP policy to update in order to test or enforce data protection. We're seeing it done right. immediately. Okay. Right. And then conversely, yep. when we come back to when we come back to the uh, come back to the console, and we just hit refresh. You're going to see the Bobby, Bobby demo, demo went from zero is, to 70. Now. Yep, he's 70. He's high. Real high. Um, right, and right. Uh, so and you can see here his entire timeline now. And then with that timeline, with Bobby demo, as we view the user insights here, we can start to see his time and his risk. He was pretty low. Now his risk shot up. So, you know, might have been gone for a little bit, might have been on vacation. Maybe he was at President's Club, and now he might be <laughs> going out. Not sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and then you can see the sequence of activity that that led to that high high state, which is great. Exactly. But I think the other thing you can see too is you see that sequence, and there you, you see very clearly what he did. It, both DLP and the on uh, the in, incident behaviors, on uh, um, right. the IOB. But then also his um, alerts. When you look at alerts versus risk, his alerts aren't unusually high versus some of the other people around him, but the his risk is significantly high. And it's um, exactly. it really has, it really is. It's created a situation where it's like, um, yeah, and and the DLP took care of it. It automated the policy to um, to give a different kind of enforcement to him because he he had become a risky user. Well, thank you, Toby, for this uh, really interesting demo on enforcement one day security. Uh, for more information, please visit our website forcepoint.com/dlp. And you'll be able to get more information on Enforcement One Data Security, as well as um, other DLP products that we do have and data security products that we're, um, we're able to provide for you. Thanks.